My purpose is to get across this very simple idea. When you compare translations, when we pick up translations as texts to study them, and you get a start text there and a translation over here, and you get good at, at comparing them, and you find out there, there are differences, shifts, and then you look for an explanation. When you do that, you are implicitly assuming not just text one, text two, but the border between them. We don't see that border because we jump over it every time we do comparative analysis. We assume it. We don't ask any questions about it because it's, it's empty. It's invisible. It's, it's blank space. That's the way translations were studied, certainly at the beginning of descriptive translation studies. We describe texts. As Julia mentioned, when James Holmes did his map of translation studies, it was a map done by somebody who studied literature, who professionally studied texts, literary texts. There was no place on the map for any people. Uh, our discipline, as it developed in the 70s, 80s, into the mid-90s, was a discipline of texts. If, however, you decide that there are people who produced that text. Somebody got to work on that one and came up with that one somehow. You have something happening in that space and you can no longer assume a simple invisible line or a neat separation. That's the importance, I think, of translator studies, as Andrew Chesterman puts it in his paper. It's also what happens when you start digging around about how historically people did get from there to there. You find it's not just a translator. It's a translator often working with a client, perhaps with a publisher, working against or for other translators, being part of a community, often a group of people who have a certain interest in moving certain ideas from one place to another. Your whole concept of history changes and what was a simple border becomes a place, a place that I've taken to calling an interculture, a place with its own culture, its own rules, its own way of working, a place where different people come with different skills and work together with the aim of defining how the primary cultures will interrelate. This interculture is a secondary social space in which people... But that's all boring theory. I don't want to give you theory. This is my text, okay? Only one text, interestingly enough. I'm not comparing it, well, not yet, to anything else. Can you see it? No. It says, in Spanish, but you don't have to know, the New Testament of our Redeemer and Saviour, uh, Jesus Christ, translated from Greek into Castilian language, Spanish. Stop there. That's it. We have a text. It's been translated from Greek into Spanish. Border. Done. Rush around, find the Greek text, compare it with what we've got here, and see what the translator did. No. Don't do that. Let's do some translator studies and read on and see what else we've got. By Francisco de Encinas. Okay. Frank Oak to his friend. Okay. And dedicated to the Caesarian majesty, I translate to literally, to the emperor. Uh, Charles V, who became Carlos I, in Spain, Charles V, Habsburgian emperor, which is why somebody here from Vienna might have known, I would have hoped. Uh, but the presentation to him happened in that year, not in Vienna, not in Madrid, not in Barcelona. Any guesses? Of course, Brussels. Yes, Brussels. Brussels. You have an emperor living in Brussels and a Spanish translator 
brings this text to him. I think it's on the 21st of November. Why does he bring it to him? Well, if it's translated from Greek, it's being translated from the text of the New Testament, which had recently been established by Erasmus of Rotterdam. Erasmus was a proto-Protestant. Erasmus had good relations with the Spanish church and then <laughs> fell out. And he was seen as the enemy. Uh, this is, to all intents and purposes, a Protestant translation, that's what the Greek thing means there, being presented to a very Christian emperor. Now, they knew that this Bible was going to be published. So it was published and an order was put out for all copies to be seized. And this was authorized not just by the Inquisition, which existed, which existed, but also by the Emperor. So Francisco, being very clever, gets the first copy, rushes to the Emperor to see him in person, and says, look, my translation of the Bible. And then it's got a passage from Joshua saying, this is the book that leaders should read. This is what you should read. And the emperor reportedly says, oh, and are you the author? And the translator, not wanting to lose his liberty quite so quickly, says, no. The holy God is the author. And it says, Abba Dios, God speaks. God is the author. I am but his humble and servile instrument. Don't shoot me, I'm only the translator. Please read this because God is speaking to you here, not me. Good strategy. A good strategy in Hispanic history because there had long been this figure of the monarch with a very ambivalent relationship to religion, uh, where before the Catholic kings and queens, Fernando Isabel, all right, uh, the role of the monarch in Hispanic history had long been to protect the religions, the three religions, the three religions being uh, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. And that's it. And, and the, the role of the monarch had been to distribute a kind of equity, which was above religious divisions. Not all monarchs, to be sure, and this guy, uh, Charles V, is a very Catholic monarch. But the strategy was not mistaken, that you can make a direct appeal. You can't go to the Inquisition and explain it to them. That's not going to work. You can't go to the church. They've got their ideology. You can go to the guy at the top and get somebody to hear what you've got to say. Do you think it worked? Not at all. Francisco was put in prison, having presented this Bible to the emperor. In prison in Brussels. Now we don't know why. We don't know what was going on there. But we do know that he escaped about five days later. So it wasn't a very good prison that he was put into. And in fact, if you look at what's happening between uh, the Emperor and the Inquisition and the Church at that stage, you see that he is trying to develop absolutism, which means taking power away from the Church. And, and the theory is he put the translator in prison for the protection of the translator, and then psh, allowed him to escape. He has learned about Protestantism from his uncle within the Church structures, uh, at a time when there was free debate, uh, before Erasmus had been ousted or broke off uh, amicable relationships with the Spanish church. He was a polyglot, and he signed, he wrote in many languages, uh, changing his own name. So he was Francisco Vigentinus, Frank Oak, as I said, in Latin, Dryander, 
When he wrote French, he was Duchenne. When he wrote German, he was Eichmann. When he wrote Dutch, he was Van Eyck. Uh, willing to assume multiple identities to go along with these multiple languages. What is in this Bible? Why would it be considered dangerous? Other passages that are designed to upset uh, can be located through the archetypical Protestant Bible, which is, of course, our friend Martin Luther. And we've got the famous passage here on the... Allein durch die Glauben, through faith alone. You reach God not through works, not through buying indulgences, not through building buildings and getting in with the Catholic Church. You get there through faith alone. Okay. That's Luther's translation, and a, a translation designed to upset the system of a church based on donations where people buy indulgences. If you go to the Spanish, the Spanish is actually closer to the text, to the Greek, than, than Luther is. He's not making the changes that Luther makes. But those very passages, as perhaps you can see, are put in capital letters. I mean, it's like he doesn't have a voice, because it's God speaking after all, and he's letting the Greek text come through. It's, it remains close to the text. But all those parts that are threats or challenges to the established church are put in capital letters, which is assuming a voice. Where did this happen? Well, consider this. When Francisco escapes from Brussels, magically, he goes to Wittenberg, which is where he had been doing the, translator, the, the, the translations with Luther and the team over there. Then he turns up in Strasbourg, Constance in Switzerland. Then he appears in Cambridge, England, as a professor of Greek. Back to Strasbourg, finally Geneva, where he dies in 1552, working on a complete edition, a new edition of his Bible in Spanish. What's interesting is that he wasn't moving back to Spain. He was working in other language, languages other than Spanish, but he found a place to move backwards and forwards, which is not a country, but it is a space in terms of European history. Maps are amazing things, historical maps, especially if you come, as I did today, in a plane and you look out and you see Europe without any national borders. This was a very different Europe from the one we have today. We have Spain here, we have the Habsburg area over here, and Charles has all this area in the middle, okay? He's sort of, got, he's got the Holy Germanic Empire, so he's got the Germanic states, but many of those princes are Protestant, and he has a very hard time controlling them, or doing much with them. So when he moves troops, he moves it through what's called the Spanish Road, which is coming up through Europe here, up the middle, okay, up through northern Italy, Switzerland, what is Alsace, Lorraine, uh, Belgium, Holland, that, that middle space of Western Europe, and the middle space out here, towards where we are here in Vienna. Okay, there were these routes that one could move between the enemies, the twin enemies of France, which he never controlled, and the Germanic states, which were becoming increasingly Protestant. Now, our translator was moving in that middle ground, which isn't a metaphor. Often it is when I speak about intercultures. I don't think you need a territory to have an interculture. It's enough to have an office of people working together. But in European history, there is that space, and it's long been there. But I want to go right back to the 9th century <laughs> of Europe when uh, the first document uh, appeared which uh, separated French and German. It was a translated treaty, okay, uh, in Old French and Old German. The Strasbourg Oaths, 
that were declared in Strasbourg in this middle area. And uh, two brothers, Charles the Bald, my personal hero in this story, and, and, and Lothar, uh, Louis, sorry, Louis the German, Ludwig der Deutsche, made a, a treaty in Strasbourg to gang up on their brother, Lothar the Middle, okay? Which is where uh, Lorraine, Lotharingen, uh, uh, comes from. That document, the Strasbourg Oaths, was sworn in German by Louis and in French by Ludwig. And it's a translated document separating the two languages. Charles over here, or French, Prince French over here, Prince German over there, and this middle ground of Lothar, which, thanks to the oath, was mil defeated militarily. France, France and Germany came together and formed their board, Strasbourg, okay? Uh, in fact, Alsace, that, 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 that region there. But in the culture, perhaps, it's just a hypothesis, Perhaps what we see operating here is this hidden Middle Europe, the place of mediation and transport, the place of translators. It's certainly what we see at the time of Charles V. We go back a long way there. But let me, I was just intrigued by this many years ago. This is a map of conference interpreters in Europe. They're professional domiciles. Those of you who do conference interpreting, this was done by the AIC. And it just struck me that look, look where they are. It's the same place. It's still there. We belong to the Middle Kingdom. Well, okay, there are many other things that are happening there. This is the rich Europe of the Rhine, of transportation systems that, that, that connect, and of the languages that connect. But still, there might be something in it that... The activities of translators as people and of intermediaries in general do not belong wholly to one culture or the other, not even geographically. My suggestion is that there is this middle ground, the area where people grow up multilingually and who are naturally the mediators for the more sedentary, uh, more primary, bigger, more powerful cultures that become the nation states. There are these areas around and between and in the overlaps of the nation states where intermediaries thrive. I'm not going to insist too much on the maps, but it's intriguing to find alternative maps to the ones that have national borders on them with big colors. If you can do a translation history based on people, those are people, rather than nation-states, then translation history is contributing something that other disciplines don't do. And that's the interest of it for me. Okay? Not to say the other maps are wrong, I'm just saying there's another way of seeing history through the eyes and movements of the mediators. In my work, I'm, I've been doing this stuff for a long, long time basically on Spanish history, as you can tell, and I've experimented with ways of presenting this. So this is from a book in the 1990s. It just looks like dots. It is. It's a series of dots, okay? This axe is geographical. This axis is geographical, going from London over here, going through Spain, the, the France, Spain, then the Eastern Mediterranean, and finishing up with Antioch over here, and we have the 12th and 13th centuries down here. So it's a strange map. This axis is, is time, and this is geography. And I'm just putting on the places where translators, translations were done that we know about. And I'm mapping translations from Arabic into Latin in the 12th century, and then into Latin and Romance in the 13th century. So it's not a banal thing I'm mapping. I'm mapping the border between Islam and Christendom, if you like, at least linguistically. Now, is it a border in the sense of a line? No. It's a very, very fluent, fluid, sorry, moving kind of border. And in this map, 
I'm assuming that the places translations are done mark the border. Translations mark the borders between cultures, languages, cultures. Put them together, ling lingua cultures. But the idea is important to me that translations are not a consequence of the borders. They're not done because the borders are there. They're done because they have to be done, because people don't speak the languages, and those are the places where cultures peter out on this side and are refreshed on that side. You get the afterlife, as Benjamin put it. But more important for me, you get that point that marks a border. What's the first thing the translation tells you? That language is there, that language is here, and someone here needed help. Someone here didn't have the language. It's a border. It's a very porous border. Up the top there is my favorite bit of this map. It's when European intellectuals came to northern Spain uh, in search of Arabic texts. And they operated uh, by themselves. They had been trained by the church, but they were no longer working in the church. These were your proto-scientists looking for pure knowledge. Then the church starts to realize what's happening. They say, hey, all this knowledge is coming in, and we can't control it. Knowledge, knowledge is knowledge from the Greeks. You know, it's Aristotle. It's medicine, it's gallon. It's stuff that's gone from Greek to Syriac to Arabic, and now is coming back into Latin, back coming into Latin over here. The church wants to know about it, so it forms a team in 1843 to translate the Quran into Latin. That's done. And then... It brings the translators down to Toledo and makes them work in Toledo as part of the cathedral structure. That's where you get the continuous line. This line is Toledo. You heard about the school of translators of Toledo? I don't think there was a school there, but certainly many translations are dated. Well, place Toledo, and there are records of them having been done there. The church picked up a translation process that existed prior to it, institutionalized it, and controlled it. That's the church. This is a bit uh, at the beginning of Alfonso the Learned's reign. This is Alfonso the Learned. Okay. It moved, control moved from church in the 12th century to the state in the 13th century. Alfonso, who had pretensions to be Holy Roman Emperor, the, the aim later realized by Charles V. Okay. Uh, so much for the map. You want to know more about the map? I got... I, I'm going back to Australia, okay, in January. I'm returning home. <laughs> and, and it's an Australian map. It doesn't look like it. But it came from reading a book by uh, an Englishman called Bruce Chatwood called The Song Lines. And uh, Chatwin spent time with the indigenous people of Australia and learned, out thing, uh, learned things about the way their cultures were working. Uh, now, these are nomadic people, and they have to mark out the borders between the tribes. And they do it in a way that's, that's a song like. You would learn, children would learn, and especially in the initiation period, would learn maps of features. And you would go walking along, and you can sing in the song what you're seeing, the mountains and the rivers and the features that you see. And everything that you can name through the song belongs to your tribe. You've inherited it because you have the knowledge through the song. And when your song runs out, you've reached the end of your territory. And there's someone else from the other tribe who knows the song that connects with yours. So Chatwin describes these song lines moving across the territory of Australia for thousands of kilometers, marking out the borders between the tribes. Not in terms of lines, as we have on our maps, but in terms of points where one song finishes and another begins, necessarily in one language and beginning in another. Okay. It's an Australian map of medieval Spain.
My point here is that translation history need not respect the borders of national histories. Translations themselves can mark out the points in space and in time. Need not respect doesn't mean that those national borders are irrelevant. They're very, very relevant. You have to come to terms with them, but you can approach them from an alternative perspective. Let me move now to the time aspect. I've been dealing more or less with geography so far. Let me deal with when. 1543. Just, this is a graph marking uh, translations of the Bible into Spanish, or anything that we could call Spanish. Okay? Uh, so there was something here done under Alfonso the Learned, the Magistrate. <coughs> and then you get this activity in the 16th century, and most of these are Protestant translations because the church decides, no, we will stay with Jerome, the Vulgate. The Bible for us will be in Latin right through the, to the early 19th century. And in the 20th century, we get evangelical uh, translations. So, what interests me in this map is that translations are irregular, if you map them over history. It's very rare to find a translation flow that is constant on the level of centuries. It's more common to find a translation, a, a language pair, where something had to be transferred and it was transferred then. Or they had to come to terms with something and it happened then. And this happened now. But in between, it's, it's sort of not much is happening. When I look at similar graphs, similar maps of translations over time, I find that irregularity repeated over and over. Translations from Korean into English. There are fatty translation flows to say, oh, we're in touch. Can you hear me? Yes, we can still translate if we have to. There's not much we have to do here. And here we've got something to do, and when that's done, it goes back to the fatic. That's worrying, isn't it? I mean, it makes sense, but it's worrying if we're training translators for long-term professions. Uh, and this is going back to my own work. This is the map you just saw. That's the 12th century, that's the 13th century, of translations of Arabic signs into Latin and, and Romance. One mountain, then another. This is another thing I did. These are poetry between French and German from 1840 through to 1940? I don't know. Yep, 1940. I was interested in uh, symbolism and post-symbolism and how that worked for Frank uh, relations between French and German. But look at the irregular mountains. You know, I, I, can, I know something... <coughs> sorry. Something went into French, and then something went back into German. I can trace that there. I can, I, I've got lots of hypotheses about what was going on, and I studied those translations. But what worries me now is, why should it jump up and down in such an erratic way? One possible explanation is this. That's one among many. The first explanation is, there is something there you know, we have Aristotle and Ptolemy and Galen, and, and you want that knowledge. And once you've got that knowledge, you're not going to translate from Arabic anymore. Okay, that's, you know. Or, you know, there, there is, uh, for the German, there's Wagner and Nietzsche. We're going to get them into French, and once we got them, we're happy. We don't need anything else. Thank you very much. Close, close the translation flow. Right. That's one explanation. But another is this. When we're working between languages, you can get an intermediary to do it for you, okay? But translators and interpreters are expensive, or should be, a luxury item. Very expensive. And they're constantly expensive. This is the transaction cost, the ex ex cost of setting up communication for translation. It gets a bit cheaper because you establish glossaries, you get technology going. But then you're paying by the word or by the hour, and it's costed. If, however, you are working with a, another language, and you have a lot of information, 
that you want to get on board, well, it makes sense to learn the language, doesn't it? Not at the beginning, because it's a lot harder to learn a language than it is to get an intermediary. But at about this time here, at some point in time, it's going to make just common sense. Learn the language more than you're going to work with the intermediaries. And out here, you're stupid if you're relying on intermediaries. You've got to learn the money languages, because it's much, much cheaper. This suggests that if there is a constant information flow, a real demand for constant production and exchange between two languages, people will learn the languages. They will not rely on us. I'm sorry. I, I wish it were otherwise. Anyway, this is just to explain a, an alternative logic about why translation flows could be irregular. Of course, there are other reasons to translate as well. Not just out of ignorance. Well, lots of literary translations are done not because we don't know the foreign language, but because we want to do something in our own language. And that's a different logic uh, entirely. If you can accept that, that translation flows tend to be irregular, you could also start to explain some of the things we discovered when we did a study for the European Commission in 2012 on the translation profession in Europe. We found that overall, about 60% of the translators in Europe share their translating activity with other things, interpreting, obviously, but also teaching, editing, writing, bringing up kids, housewife, houseman, the whole lot, all right? There's a whole lot of multitasking going on that we tend to forget about because we want it to be a well-established profession where people only do one thing. But the sad reality, I don't know, it could be a happy reality, is that people are multitasking. They're translating when there's work on, they're interpreting when there's a conference to do, and when there's not, they're doing other things with their language skills. It makes sense. It makes a whole lot of sense if translation flows are necessarily irregular. And the second point, is that about 74% are freelance. Okay, a lot of variation according to country. But there has been a move from in-house fixed translators to a freelance market, small companies, individual service providers, who are incredibly flexible. What you get, putting these two together, there's a third thing there, it's about 70% women, but I don't want to go into that because I always get criticized when I try to relate fact of being a woman to these other things, but that's what it is, uh, you get a very, very flexible labor force, which can adapt, which can be there when, when a big job is, is needed, and then disappear into other jobs when not. And that's also why most big companies have outsourced their language services, including the European Commission, which relies on a lot of you know, lists of people on call when it's needed. These are worrying things, not just for the translation histories that are based on fixed nations with, with, with regular movements between them. You don't find that. I don't find that in my data, at least. Perhaps you do. But it's also worrying for people who want the translation profession to be a closed shop. That you, know, you have to have a certain qualification to be recognized as a translator or interpreter, and once you're there, that's your job, you're well paid forever. The suggestion is it just doesn't work like that in history. I, I hasten to add there are alternatives. I, I've been working with people uh, at my own university in Spain who uh, have been at El Paso, on the border between Mexico and, and the United States, studying the translation services there. Believe me, they are very constant translation services, just because it's a long, very active border that looks like being active between Spanish and English for a long time to come. So there's no fatality in what I'm saying, or perhaps I've just been studying the wrong corners of history. I'm reporting from my own limited experience.
Going back to Francisco Fientinas. Why did he do that? Why would he go to the emperor and give him a translation, knowing full well it wasn't going to be pleasing to him? Well, <coughs> later on, we get 1558, and Themis's, um work on religion in, in the Low Countries, uh, written 1545, but published then in French in Strasbourg. And it's an open criticism of the Inquisition. You know, his, he is a Protestant, but not just a Protestant in terms of faith. He's a Protestant in terms of liberty against power structures and, and, and repression of freedom of speech. I mean, he, he knows, I mean, he's got some guts. He, he's a bit stupid, but he's got some guts to go and do that, proclaiming freedom of speech, knowing well, according to his own writings, that there is none, because there is a thing called the Inquisition. The Inquisition didn't get him, but he got his brother, the closest thing he could get, who was burnt at the stake in Rome for heresy. Both were following the ideas of Erasmus. This brings me to the last real thing I want to present here, dealing with that other, the closed nation state with the linear boundary. You cannot pretend it doesn't exist. You know, I have, I've grown, all the years I've been doing this, I've been working alongside postmodern deconstructionists keen to pull apart everything. And I can do that too if I have to. But sooner or later you have to recognize a closed power structure when it's sitting there looking at you and acting on you or acting on the, the, the translators in the history you're working with. You can't pretend it doesn't exist. And some of the hardest moments in writing history are coming to terms with that. Very quickly after the events I proclaimed, not with Charles the, the V, but his son, Felipe II, Philip II of Spain, we get a, a repressive regime put into place by the state power. So we get an index of prohibited texts. If you want to bring books in, not just translations, you want to bring any book in, you have to get a special license. It has to be approved. So you're controlling the movement of texts, thereby controlling the movement of translations. If you want to go out and study outside of Spain, you have to get approval for that as well. These people are scared of the movement of ideas, and that repressive regime is put in place very quickly. The Bible becomes the Vulgate. You will study Jerome's Latin text, and that's it. Uh, the repression works not just in what is Spain, but also in movements to the colonies. Because the, the church figures, the, the friars, uh, the <coughs> de las Casas, who, who have been agitating for more rights for the indigenous cultures there and the indigenous people themselves, um, are controlled. De las Casas is told to stay there. He can't move. He has to get permission to move between Spain and the Spanish colonies. Books have to be approved before they can move out there as well. And then 1538, uh, all communication between the Pope and the colonies has to be approved by the Spanish crown, by the Consejo de las Indias. So the state moves against not just the free movement of ideas, but also against the church, which has these strange people who believe in free speech hanging around in it. Now, if you don't study the translators, you don't see how that repression was working. So you can get at the state structures, you can get at the closed borders, but you do it from the effects rather than the assumption. It's problematic for me because I, I, um, I published a book called Negotiating the Frontier, which has many of these ideas in it. And that book is incredibly unpopular with my Spanish colleagues because the what's called the siglos de oro, the, great, the centuries of the flourishing of Spanish culture, Spanish culture's gift to the world, is precisely the 16th century, 16th and 17th centuries when you get the great works of art. 
Okay, uh, Cervantes, Quixote, Lope de Vega, Calderon, <laughs> Siglo de Oro, golden centuries. And I'm looking at this and seeing that for me, it's a repressive regime doing exactly the worst possible things for my people, the translators in there. And so we get this implicit debate, sometimes not so implicit, um, between those, I have the misfortune of writing in English as a poor Anglo-Saxon, and I get accused of um, circulating what's called La Leyenda Negra, the black legend of everything bad in Spain. And then they think, oh, because it was much better in British colonization in Australia and, and Africa. No, no, British colonization was just as bad, if, you know, if infamy has degrees. Uh, you get into a, a debate about whether or not a culture is good or bad in its totality. It's black or it's white. There's this white legend, everything was great. This black legend, it was really bad. And then there's history. For example, what my book does is go through the series of expulsions, starting with the Jews in 1492, then the Moriscos, then the Jesuits, then the people who believed in the French Revolution, and then the people who believed in political liberalism, 1823, 1939, the Republicans who lost the Spanish Civil War. This whole culture for me has expelled its most interesting elements periodically. And the translators of this culture are among those groups. That's why so much translating has happened outside of Spain. These are your most cultivated, educated polyglots. All right. I'm looking at an object that has systematically perpetuated a split between domestic culture and exiled culture where translations are done far more by the exiled culture than by the domestic culture. But it's incredibly problematic when you look at this object and try to describe that history and without falling into that accusation of the black legend, as if everything was bad or everything was good. <coughs> For me as, as a historian, it has to be that the culture is both of those sides at once. It has to be that dialectic between what was done outside and what was happening inside. I know there was communication from the outside and inside. I know that because the borders are always porous, that no regime entirely cuts itself off from anywhere else. It's impossible to do in, 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 in human affairs, even more so with, with affairs of languages. The mistake is to fall into a trap of judging a whole culture to be superior or inferior. That is a nationalist discourse of history. That is a way of us and them, of perpetuating conflict. For the historian, it's absolutely necessary not to go into those questions. I explain, by the by, why I've never supported a boycott of infamous cultures. You have to keep speaking with people. The people who will speak with you, you have to keep speaking with them. This is very important for translation studies in its recent decades. <coughs> Pick up those principles. Make them ethical principles of our discipline and put them to work when we write the history of the translators of the past and the future of the translators of the present. Thank you very much.